Good evening, everybody. Can you hear me okay? There's trouble with the mic, but I guess you can hear me. Is that, I don't think it's can you, Jen, is there more or less? No. I have to grab it again. Oh, it is on. Okay. It is on. Is that better? Yes. Yes. I can hear myself now, too. <laughs> Good evening, everybody. We're going to call the meeting to order uh, 6.5. Welcome, we're really excited to have our honorable representative and sinners here with us. Thank you for taking the time to come and chat with us and be part of our community. We are starting a little bit later than we wanted, but we want to take time to have everybody introduce themselves so we get to know you and you get to know us. After introductions, we would quickly just ask you to maybe share a little bit about what your priorities are and then the board members could ask some questions, if that's okay with you guys. Okay, so we'll get started and I think we'll just go around and maybe start with you, Anne, and come down. I don't know how we're going to do it with the mic. Okay. <laughs> Mark, Mark can run the mic. I'm pretty loud. Okay. <laughs> okay. okay. And I forgot to say one thing. If anybody's comfortable, you can introduce yourselves with your pronouns too. You don't have to. But if you would like to, go ahead. Okay, thanks. I have the button, so sure. <coughs> I'm Representative Ann Donahue. I'm from Northfield and also represent Berlin. Hi, Ellen Chapin. Uh, nice to see everyone. Glad to be here. And I represent East Montclair and Middlesex. Uh, I'm Maya Elliott. I use she, they pronouns, and I am a student representative. Oh. I'm Willow. I'm from Middlesex, and I use she, her pronouns, and I'm also from Middlesex. Or, I'm also a student representative. <laughs> Good evening, I'm Natasha Ecker Banning, representative of Worcester, and I use she, her pronouns. Hello, I'm Daniel Keeney. I represent Callis, uh, and I use he, him pronouns. Hi, I'm McKinney Claire. I'm a board member for Worcester, and I use she, her pronouns. Maggie Weiss, Callis. Also, she, her, pronouns. Thanks for joining us. I am Ursula Stanley. I use she, her pronouns, and I'm a member from Middlesex. Hi, I'm Megan Roy. I'm the superintendent, and I use she, her pronouns. I'm Gloria Smith. I'm Ms. Montgelier, and I use she, they, yeah, pronouns. Hey, I'm Kari Bradley. I'm uh, from Callis, and I use he, hey. Uh, Joe Cito Van Fleet from Worcester, he, him, and I'm also, uh, um, I think that's it. <laughs> 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 I'm Libby Johnson, and I'm from East Montpelier. Hi, I'm Josh Vesevitz, I'm from Middlesex, I use he, him, pronouns. Uh, I'm Chris McVay from Middlesex, a board of and I use he, him, a program. Well, I'm Andrew Perksnick. I live in Marshfield. I represent the Washington District. And I use to be or Ed. Hi, I'm Ann Cummings. I live in Montpelier. I also represent the Washington District, and I'm she, her. Thank you, everybody. I'm wondering. No. Just wondering if we have anybody in Zoom. Uh, Mark? There are four, two people that have come in, yeah. but I don't see anyone else waiting in the waiting room right now. Okay, can you give them a chance to introduce themselves? Eric. Sure. Is there Eric? Eric? Yep. Hi, I'm Eric Anderson. I am representative from East Montpelier. He, him, sorry, I have a uh, um, shuttle duty tonight for Thank you. And then I forgot one thing, and because it's all in practice, and we really wanted to do the land acknowledgement tonight, and I forgot to ask this 
students, and I wonder if you mind doing that now, just so that we can get into practice of doing it. Uh, Delhi is located on the land which has long served as a site of meeting and exchange among indigenous peoples for thousands of years and is home of the Western Abenaki people. Delhi honors, recognizes, and respects these people, especially the Abenaki, as the traditional stewards of the lands and waters on which we gather today. In that spirit, today we will begin by acknowledging that we're guests in this land. We need to respect and help protect the lands within our use. With that, I will let the microphone first. And or Andrew, I would like to be met up with this is both Spanish, I don't know. <laughs> go for it. Um, so I guess we'll, we'll just go around and give a, a view of the legislative session. I assume you only want to hear about education policy issues and not just everything that's going on. I and mean, there's obviously a lot going on with housing and childcare and things that intersect with education. Um, I, I serve on the Transportation and Appropriations Committee, but I was served on the Education Committee for two terms, so I have that background of education policy. We know we had a lot of work in the last session with the waiting study, which I know you guys spoke about a lot. That's going to be rolled out over the next few years. I think that's something that's going to hopefully really benefit the whole state, and really looking forward to how we have more equi equitable weights and how that provides more funding for the, the students that, that need that extra support. Uh, Senator Cummings and I were on an income-based education study committee about switching the education fund from property tax to an income tax. That was a very interesting time. It turned out I was very supportive of that. I sponsored a bill with Senator Polina last term. Uh, but we definitely found out it's trickier than we, than we thought, or at least that I thought. Uh, it's very difficult how, how you deal with renters and, and a lot of different things. There's, so there's still some discussion about how we could do that. That would definitely impact how you guys do your work here, I think, and how towns operate in general. So there's going to be some, some more discussion about that. Um, I think the, those are the two big things that are you know, kind of in the background. I know the Education Committee is really looking at literacy, really concerned about scores and coming out of COVID and how we deal with that and how we can be supportive of teachers. I know there's still 1,200 or some teaching openings in the state. How can we support teachers to be stay in the profession and get more people into the profession? So definitely interested in that from just education policy, but also in appropriations, how we can provide funding for, you know, paying people's tuition, and, you know, their student loans if they went into teaching, other ways to support, especially special education teachers, and special education in, in general. There's the community school program that we started a few years ago, and that's, that, I think that is, that pilot study, I'm really interested in how that works and what the outcomes are that and how we can provide that kind of funding for, for all schools because schools just in general are doing so much more for our communities than they used to as far as just taking on all the other community needs that our families and students have. And so they should be compensated for that and I think it's, it's a good role for the schools for some of these things. For the, for the schools to take care of the children in this way. I guess the other big education thing that, I'm, that is happening is this universal means. Mm -hmm. we, we passed it last year, we funded it with the, the, the extra funds that we had in the education fund at the time, but we didn't create a long-term funding source. So that is definitely gonna be a big discussion. That 20 some million dollars on top of $29 million or whatever it is going to be on top of the, the money for child care, on top of the money people want to do for pay family leave, on top of the other things. So it's it's going to be interesting how that stacks up with all the other programs that we're trying to do. So I'll leave it at that so I don't have questions. I'm, I'm Ann Cummings. Um, and 
I serve on economic development, which is my third time through there, but it's new to me this year. I've spent about the last six years on health and welfare, and I chair finance. Um, my job is to find out how to pay for all of these things. Um, we spent this afternoon looking at the child care bill and some of the possible ways to raise the $279 million. And it, it depends on how, many, how how high we go up in income level, um, how much we subsidize, how much payment is there. One of the studies has put the price tag pretty close to 400 million, um, not decimal dust. So we're looking at that. Universal Meals does come up. Um, the meal study, I was told, was released today. Uh, last year, we were told that there were a whole lot of kids that we were underreporting the kids that were eligible for federal subsidy. Um, that hasn't materialized. It looks like it may go down a little bit more because of the federal Medicaid thing, but we're staying somewhere between 27 and 31 million. Um, the question with child, you know, we also have a child tax credit, which went in last year. We were thinking parents could use that for child care. Um, so we may be rethinking some of this in trying to get a child care bill out. Uh, all the employers, and I assume schools are right there, you need your teachers to be here, and in order to be here, they need child care. Um, the other thing we're working on um, is, uh, in economic development, we have a major housing bill we hope to get out um, definitely this month. Um, there was a summer study committee. We're working on a lot of local planning, zoning, funding, um, trying to facilitate the development of workforce housing um, in some of our more densely populated downtown and village centers. And that one will be coming out. And um, after that, we're going to be dealing in workforce, which I believe is starting in the House. They're going to, they're doing it first, and then it will come to us. But again, how part of the problem with the child care bill is no matter how much money we throw at it, we don't have the child care workers, even if we raise wages, to put everything that needs to be there to meet the need there. We know we don't have the teachers, we don't have the nurses. Um, we have, and we're not alone. This is pretty much a national issue. We're aging. We were told that by 2050, maybe 2040, 25% of our population will be over 65. So, um, no, by 2050, there will be more old people than children for the first time ever. And I think it's by 2030 something, a quarter will be over 65. So we're trying to figure out how to recruit younger people. Um, also working on um, the impact of all the CLA violations. We usually we have one or three or four towns that are outside the CLA boundaries Well, because of the rapid increase in housing price. Uh, we have 34 towns. Um, we're going to work, I mean, you, you can't get appraisers, so um, we're probably going to be doing something to smooth that out. Also, there's a question on if you're income sensitized in your property tax, but suddenly your $200,000 house is worth $500,000 house, are you going to, you know, be, even though your income hasn't changed, are you going to be hit with a major increase? So. All I, my mantra has become, we're working on it, uh, and, and we are, um, but there, there's just a lot of very complicated issues with if money, we could print it in the basement, we'd be fine, but we can't, and uh, we, we just have a lot of heavy lifting to do. Chapin, representative, um, um, uh, I forgot to mention that I use 
she, her, they pronouns. And um, I'm kind of new. I sit on the Judiciary Committee, so not a huge member of school um, related things that I'm uh, working on at the moment. <laughs> but I would say I'm going to be working on a lot of issues that affect families and children and equity issues. Um, we're looking at a lot of bills already that affect uh, how we really work on diversion and restorative justice as tools in our communities and how we um, increase the equity around our state of access to those kinds of programs because they're not geographically e equally accessible in our communities across the state. Um, right now we're working on the, sh the reproductive uh, shield bill to, um, to protect patients and providers around both um, reproductive health care as well as um, gender affirming care. Uh, so those shield bills that we're working on in the legislature will address both populations equally. Um, uh, I wanted to just bring up the, um, and I don't think either of you guys mentioned, just the, uh, the, the decision that's come from the uh, Supreme Court around um, public funding for independent schools and how the decision related to Maine is going to affect Vermont pretty immediately. Probably you're getting information from the Department of Education on this. And, um, I understand that we are moving towards some activity in the legislature. I'm not very familiar with the details yet, but we are certainly thinking a lot about how to ensure that our, our students do not have, um, that all have, uh, you know, are not in, in environments, no public funding is going to environments that have any discrimination. Um, I know my understanding is the legislature recently passed um, some uh, bills around ensuring that independent schools address, uh, dis uh, ensure they're um, providing equal services for um, children with disabilities, and we're going to be looking at something along those lines to make sure that, that discrimination is, is not happening with public funds. So um, there may be a lot more going on in that regard and a lot of conversations, but I, I guess I know that that's going to be a priority for the legislature this year, hopefully to our students by any Hi, uh, Representative Van Donahue again, um, and I've spent all my time in the legislature on, on health and human services, on one committee or the other, back and forth on human services. Um, this year, we're working closely with the health care committee, but um, we actually, both committees went on a field trip today. We uh, spent a better part of the day down at Washington County Mental Health, um, and um, so, I know that you won't be surprised to hear that we have a huge crisis in mental health with kids, um, which obviously has a huge uh, impact on the schools. Um, and the workforce issue comes up there, as with everywhere, one of the really frightening things we heard. Washington County Mental Health has uh, 16 beds in what they call micro, um, they're very intensive wraparound to children uh, in a home. Um, and they have 16 total, but they actually can only operate four of those 16 currently because they don't have the staffing uh, for the rest. And that means all those beds that kids could be in who are instead, they said, you know, either in emergency departments or uh, remaining um, at the Broward River Retreat when they don't need to be there anymore, <coughs> but they're stuck there. Um, they also were telling us in terms of their uh, crisis, mobile crisis team, um, it used to be, you know, even 10 or so years ago, um, maybe three calls a month on average uh, would be a, a child crisis as opposed to responding to an adult in crisis. Um, and now it can be three a day. Um, it's that radical change. Um, we are also working on the whole question of the, the replacement services for what used to be at uh, Woodside. And when Woodside closed, you know, the average number of children there was somewhere between maybe five or six or zero um, in that range. Um, and now the proposals are for as many as um, 18 to 24 or more as needing to uh, replicate what used to be uh, covered by that in terms of um, locked uh, children's uh, treatment or stabilization programs for justice-involved kids. 
So, you know, a, a whole lot of issues to be dealing with in, in that sphere as well. And, and we're just, you know, obviously the session is just started. So uh, we will also have um, the health, the child care bill um, in our committee. And we've heard the same overview report um, and um, all of the different financial pressures. So um, it's the start of a, a challenging year. Thank you, everybody. I'm going to ask Anne, who's going to join us. Sorry, Anne. I'm Senator Bond Link. So, do you mind introducing yourself, Anne? Yeah, and thank you. Priority for the year two, and if you want to share your pronouns too. Sure, yeah. So, uh, Anne Watson, she, her pronouns. Uh, uh, the newest senator for the Washington district. And um, I'm just uh, also really grateful for the remote option uh today can you can all hear me okay yeah, yeah. okay great um uh, well so so thank you so i am on uh the senate natural resources and energy committee as well as government operations and uh, uh i mean a lot of the uh priorities that i have um for myself are around climate which is great to be plugged into the natural resources and energy committee uh, getting to work on things in that space, but just thinking about things that might, would be relevant for, for you all, for the school district, um, is actually probably more in line with the government operations, uh, because we we just passed a, a bill that uh, allowed the uh, COVID uh, provisions of um, meeting remotely and, and not necessarily having a physical presence, that just got extended. Um, uh, and so that's, and, and we're actually going to be taking up a bill, uh, I think, in the coming weeks about uh, some potentially permanent changes to open meeting law, uh, you know, gathering all that we've learned about uh, be, having to meet remotely through COVID and, and uh, seeing if we can make some of these changes um, permanent. So if you have any uh, suggestions around uh, how that could or should look, I'm certainly open to that. Uh, and um, yeah, so those are those are just a couple of uh, pieces that I think might, well, at least one piece anyway, that, that'd be relevant for you all. The other thing, and I realize this is not related to my committees, but we did just get a, a link from the state treasurer. Um, has any of, you, any of you talked about this yet, the unclaimed property? Um, you have talked about this? No. Okay. Um, so uh, there, it, there's a database of um, unclaimed property that, I mean, the, the fund itself has millions of dollars that are basically owed back to Vermonters. And I, I took the time uh, ahead of this meeting to just look up to see if um, any of the, like the school district was owed any money. And it turns out that um, uh, Berlin Elementary, Romney Elementary, and um, uh, East Montpelier Elementary are all in the database as being owed money. And they're, they're different amounts of money. One of them is, um, at, at least one of them is like in the in the $200 or more category. So, um, you know, might be worth tracking down. Um, so it doesn't, doesn't specify how much, um, and, and to be fair, I, that that is uh, it, it looked to me like it was showing up um and so you know it, it's I, I think it's worth it's worth looking into um i i obviously can't say it's definitely you know you all but it's worth it, it looked to me like it was you all so um worth worth tracking down i'm happy to send along a link if that is useful um so i think uh i will leave it there for now uh, can I just interject something on that? Really, on behalf of uh, some of the new um, representatives, if you get the brilliant idea of a constituent service where you look at the list and call the people in your town, maybe think twice. I tried that one year. I called and asked for John Smith, and there was a kind of cold silence, and he died years ago. What are you calling about? <laughs> well, I, there was one other thing I wanted to, to, I forgot to mention, that is school construction. Something that I worked on in education committee, so I shouldn't have forgotten it, but there's the assessment that we did, and then there's 
the evaluation, I think we use a different term, that's going to, the report's going to come out in October. But talking about the treasurer reminded me, because we've had some meetings with the treasurer about how do we get back to having some state aid for construction. And because our schools, what we learned from the assessment are in, which we all knew, which are in a lot of deferred maintenance, to say the least. And so how can the state help make our buildings to be adequate for teaching children? Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Now let's open it up to board members and students. And if you have any particular questions. Here. I can just talk. Okay. I don't know if any of you can speak to this, but when I hear, you know, finding um, educators, we know that there have been in the past some significant challenges with the Office of Professional Responsibility and the process for achieving licensure, in particular if you're coming from a different state or trying to return to the state um, if your license is expired. And I'm wondering if anyone can speak to the, that challenge. Uh, yes, last year in the, in the workforce bill, uh, we actually directed the uh, Office of Professional Responsibility to, to do uh, an intensive review of the, specifically around um, mental health counselors, the licensure on some of those interstate, what the barriers were and what we needed to be doing to address them because there, there are a lot and it wasn't something we could just say, stop doing that, um, but we told them we need them to, um, to identify those barriers. There also is a uh, an interstate compact bill that's in the healthcare committee being acted on right now to help move on that. Is that specific just to mental health professionals, but also educators? Uh, I'm sorry. Yeah, you asked educators. Yeah. I, the one th that was the area where the biggest barriers were were identified. Mm -hmm. So it may be that we need to take a look at educators then as the next piece because that was the one that kept coming up. So. Yeah, thank you. For yeah, and related, and, and or anyone, a number of years ago, because education licensing falls under the Agency of Education, it's oh, so it does not fall under Office of Professional okay. Services unless you're a speech pathologist, yes. in Sorry. which case you yeah. have to do both. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but there was a number of years ago some conversation about whether or not it should be moved to OPR, and it was a very controversial topic. Um, and I didn't know if that, because of the workforce shortage issues, are, is anyone hearing any rumbling about that being brought back up? I have not heard anything. Okay. We, we did talk about an education, and I was surprised at how complicated it was. It seemed like it was almost yes. purposefully complicated at a time when we didn't have such a crisis. So I, we, there, like Ann said, it wasn't like you know stop doing that one thing. It was, it was difficult. But they, well, what AOE was saying is like, well, we're offering waivers for a lot, you know. So there's a lot of people teaching on waivers, which doesn't seem to be a sustainable solution. One thing that we were working with the teachers union on is kind of build your own, they're talking like parent educators or other people that are already in the building that don't have a license, how can we get them a license with their lived experience and make that an easier process? So that was something that we started. I don't know where that is right now, but I know that there's interest in those kind of things. But I haven't heard about moving it to OPR. Yeah, I just, I wanted to ask about um, um, tax rates for second homeowners. Um, just, we've talked either today or on other days in the course of developing our budget about affordability and declining enrollment and an aging population. And it feels very troubling that there's that, I, I think we saw an article earlier this year about all these towns in Vermont that have lower tax rates for second homeowners than they do for primary homeowners. But I think I'm curious about what you all have heard, what the considerations are about raising taxes sort of statewide on second homeowners in the current context. Okay, right now we have two categories, homestead or non-homestead. And non-homestead are all those, not your full-time residents and businesses. 
Um, I'm working on the assumption that there is a bill, uh, we started working on one last year, to do a more granular um, division in that non-homestead area. The reason second homes may be paying a lower tax rate is that when we did Act 60, or probably the adjustment, when we divided out homestead, non-homestead, we set the tax rate. Um, it was higher than the homestead tax rate. And we set it there, but whatever the formula is, we knew at that time that eventually, if school budgets kept going up, that it would surpass. It surpassed in Plainfield quite a few years ago. Um, it's going to be a painful discussion, and so I think you tend to keep kicking the can, but as we look at that, um, it, I think it's probably time we recalibrated how those tax rates, they all go up now with the same percentage, um, the same impact. But I'm, if we don't um, see a bill to further look at those non-residential, non-primary residents, um, I anticipate something will end up in my favorite Christmas tree. Um, the uh, miscellaneous tax bill, which is where we can kind of, a Christmas tree is a bill on which one can hang things, and miscellaneous tax is such a broad subject that it tends to get well decorated the last few weeks of the session, and things that have been floating around and not dealt with um, tend to end up there, but I'm anticipating that I'm going to see a bill for the income-based education funding, and then I'm going to see a bill on second homes. And it's just, I think because there's so many new people, bills have been just very slow. I have three bills and one doesn't belong to me on, my, on the board that have come to finance. I should have about 10 by now. So it's, They've just been slow getting out this year, probably because of the, the one-third turnover in both bodies. Um, but I have faith they will show up. <laughs> so I can say it is something that I've heard a lot of people bring up, and it came up on the Income-Based Education Tax Committee, and it's not quite a recommendation in there, but it's, it says, like, you should look at this. And people that are legislators that I talked to, which is probably a small sample of all 180, <coughs> are supportive of it. Thank you. The problem comes with deer camps. Hi, so my, I don't know if this is a question so much or a comment. My, my day job is a family physician, so firstly, um, we're sold school meals I'm really rooting for because um, I think that's so important to safe and healthy schools. Um, and also during our most recent budget discussion, um, one of the challenges we ran into is some of the federal COVID relief funding that's gonna be expiring has been used in our schools to fund um, additional nursing and school counselors. Um, and finding the money to continue that is gonna be a little challenging. So um, just putting a plug in at the state level, I don't know, in the mental health bills you're thinking about, if some funds could be directed to schools for that. Because I think, as, as you all know, that need is not going away, but the money, the federal money is. Well, my brief comment on it is that the proposed budget from the governor this year has come out and it has a 0% increase for um, our designated agencies, mental health and um, developmental services. So that is obviously something we're going to have to deal with because particularly in today's days of inflation, 0% means it's cutting something that we know we're very short on right now. Um, and the schools are obviously a huge piece of what the designated agencies uh, work on with the success after six, success before six. I always say we, we leave out all of our six-year-olds in the state. <laughs> Because we have success before six and we have success after six. <laughs> but we do nothing when you're sick. <laughs> I, 
I'm, oh, I turned off. <laughs> I think you all know this, but I'll just add on to that comment. One of the realities that schools face, we are not allowed to have wait lists. We are not allowed to not serve students. Mm -hmm. And so when reductions, there are an end, and a number of years ago there was an actual study done looking at how much funding schools are supporting that they're really supporting we are really supporting because there is not there are not community based services so i know that i'm i feel like i would be remiss if i didn't say that that's part of the challenge is we are not a, we, students come in our door and we have to figure out how to meet their needs so oh there's one there okay. Hey there. Uh, I have a question about the pre-K funding. Um, I don't think the governor's budget will get into this, but I wonder, do you think it will be in the form of direct payments to parents? Um, I think you mentioned the uh, child tax credit. Um, I know at the federal level that was direct payments mm -hmm. to parents. And I just wonder if you have any idea if that's going to be payments towards centers, um, or parents, and if that's going to be means tested, or sort of, if you have any. Uh, the short answer is no. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Um, I know the status of four-year-olds and in the schools, and um, that's all going to have to be dealt with as part of the issue we've got. And it's how do we pay for that? Um, in within the, the education fund, we have had a huge surplus um, because people went out and bought the things they were s supposed to buy with uh, the federal money that got sent out. That's what it's supposed to do, but it's going away. And by next year, it will be gone. Um, at the state level, we have done a very good job of only doing one-time appropriations. The mental health system has been underfunded for years. Um, we know you need mental health workers in your school. Um, you know, the families need counselors, and this is, this is not new. COVID just brought it on. It just focused, it. it's like childcare. It just brought it to the forefront. Um, all in, we're going to be, when we look at that, we're going to have to be looking at what do we do with four-year-olds? You know, they're, they're kind of in school for, I think it's 10 hours a week. Well, do we keep them there? Do we, and who pays? Um, we put money in for universal meals. There's a lot of people that feel probably here, you have a lot of kids who qualify. You get into Montpelier, you probably don't have as large a group. And could that money be better spent? And could you find a way to feed the kids that really need to be fed without a stigma? And I, in this day of swipe cards, I mean, I put money in my account at the state house. I go up, I give them my number. They just take it out of my account. I, you know, I could go up and give them my number and it could say free or just whatever, covered. Um, that would take some startup money, I'm sure, but we're looking at a lot of that. We, we've kind of piecemealed these systems. We also put money in last year, it's up to $32 million for the PCB testing that we're doing in the schools. There is, that, that was just the amount of money we could find. Um, and at the same time, do some tax rate reductions and other things. No way do we think that's enough money, but we, we're quite sure. I mean, we're all saying, is there another Burlington High School out there? Um, we're hoping Cabot's already found some. We're hoping we can keep it localized, but um, that's a big concern out there. And I'm sure you don't want to deal with parents. It, it turns out there's a lot of toxicity in any of your schools. I was just going to add that there's a lot of talk about pre-K and how that overlaps with child care discussion. So there's some bills to make it universal pre-K, fourth graders only public schools, not allow any payments to go to private providers, 
that really concerns other people. So that's that's why the short answer is no. We don't know what it's going to be because that's part of the, the big debate. Second. Second. We'll see if there's any other questions, or we'll add a couple. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I, uh, I feel compelled to say that uh, they, I believe that uh, maybe the most significant issue our district faces in the coming years is our declining student enrollment. And I, I know you know that. And you, you spoke to um, a couple of things you're doing, but our projections show that our um, population will decline by about 20% in the next three years, and our projections aren't usually wrong. And uh, you know we're in our smallest school in the district, and I'm just looking at the banners and wondering what the class of 25 and beyond is going to look like. And I, again, I know you talked about housing and um, childcare; those are pieces of the puzzle, and these are complex, long-term challenges. But I felt you have to hear it from us because we represent thousands of people who care deeply about these schools. And we're on the precipice of some very significant change. We don't know what the implications are for the fabric of our towns. Mm. Well, just thank you first for being on the board. I know these are tough decisions. I think being on the school board is tougher than being in the legislature. <laughs> and so thanks for struggling with that. I wish we had a good answer for how we could change that around or just even stabilize it. I mean, the one thing that I think is going to help, I mean, child care in general, but I think specifically some kind of maternal parental leave. I, I have a lot of coworkers. I, I'm in the work for the state when I'm not in the legislature. A lot of them just have, we can't have anyone. I have one kid, and I'm like, that's all we can deal with because of child care and just leaving work. So I think a maternal paternal leave program could just at least help have people, families, think about it. Questions? No, I was just going to say that is in the mix. Um, we have a bill that went through last year that did a very broad range of um, family leave. There's some discussion about, well, since it costs $36,000 a year to provide child care to an infant, um, maybe we could start with paternal leave and, you know, help families, not everybody wants to put their infant into childcare. So um, it's it's all out there right now. It's just kind of swinging around in the blender, but eventually something will come out of it. This is sausage making at its finest. <laughs> I, I would just want to add a couple of things. One is that when we're talking about PCDs and infrastructure, also reminding ourselves about our career and technical education centers for the workforce. You know, we can, just in Washington Central, we have more kids that want to go to the career technical centers and we don't have the capacity for, for them either. So that infrastructure money is really important to us. And it, emphasizing what Kari said, we also know that we're going to face, uh, low, because of the inflation rate and low revenues, I don't know what we can put in the rainy fund for later on, you know, to, to, to help us, you know, this year is hard. The, our budgeting for 24-25 is going to be probably the hardest budget that we'll ever be facing. It, and, and it's not just us, we're around the country. So, you know, whatever you can do for that, you know, healthcare, there's so many things. And the last is the preschool. I know that that preschool bill just dropped on your laps today. It, to just really look at it and, and make sure that you're getting different perspectives for who comes to testify. And, and, and I know that there's, you know, scary to think that you can't send to private providers. I, I think the most important to, thing to remind ourselves is our moral obligation to serve all our kids and that is the foundation of our democracy, what we're doing with those public funds, right? So we can't have two systems that don't play by the same rules, right? So it's okay to send it to a private provider that is, that is complying with the same rules, right? Take, we don't take, we take all our blueberries like that, <laughs> authors at once, you know, we don't send them back, right? We take a, and we serve all of them, and that's not the case in, in other places, right? So just to, you know, we have finite resources. So, so but thank you for all you guys uh, 
do too. And mm -hmm. good luck. We'll be coming over. <laughs> <laughs> and I, when the, my aunt Willow. <laughs> I want to bring you on the spot, but you guys are such good leaders, and I know that you have experience before going to stay house, Maya. You want to have any? <laughs> Poor Maya. Now that I know you're in the spot. <laughs> I do. I was a page in eighth grade. I don't yeah. know how you knew that. Um, <laughs> I don't know. I was just listening, and I was trying to understand most of it, which means like 70% of it probably is out there. Um, I don't know, I just want to say that I think the meal plans are incredibly important. Just looking around at my fellow students, not only those that um, <laughs> like can't afford it, I know, I know some who would refuse to get it because it's embarrassing, but also those who maybe their parents could afford it, but it was still difficult, and so they didn't eat. And the fact that the food is now free, I've seen so many more people get lunch, and it's a big struggle sometimes for people to eat. Um, so that's a huge thing, but yeah, that's the, that's what I could think of. <laughs> on the so to touch base on the mental health stuff in school, we have a, like kind of like a presentation for the next school board meeting. We didn't bring it today, but it's we sent out a survey to all the students, all the high school students, with questions. One of them being, "What makes you get out of bed in the morning?" and then what's something someone wouldn't know by just looking at you. And we got a ton of responses, I think like 95, it like bumped up. And that's a lot for like a high school survey. <laughs> like I'm guilty of just hitting the trash button when I see one in school. <laughs> but 92 is a lot and the responses were so genuine. So we're excited to like share what they said and like, yeah, so, Maya. <laughs> I was actually just about to ask the representatives um, how much contact you have with students. I know they started some sort of student group, I think, to work with the state. State council, student yeah. youth, a youth council, yes, was started last year. Um, I think I, I do have friends who's on that, but we can try to get you the info that we get from the survey and other stuff going forward as well. My committee members have interns, so they're college students, but they're youth to me. Um, and then we have the pages, um, but th that's that's about it. Um, there are a lot of mentor mentees in the state house today, but not a lot of opportunity to to talk, and that I think is important. It's, two-way street so you can understand why we aren't just doing everything that you think we should do and we can understand what you think we should be doing and be, let's look at the youth council and see what that feedback to us is uh, so that we do learn from that. One thing I don't know if this happened with Maya when you were a page but Chair Campion of the Senate Education Committee started two years ago and to do it this year is always have the pages in to, because they're students so they're, they're getting testimony right from those, at least those students that are pages about their experience in Vermont schools, which I thought was good. Yeah, I don't think that was a thing when I was a page, but it's really good that you guys are trying to get more student voice, especially with the student representatives committee. Um, but I would say just like, yeah, keep a lookout and keep talking to students. I don't know if you guys want to hear some of the responses, but, um... Oh, it's okay. I, I, hold on one minute. Me, yeah, sure, thank you. Well, I, so I neglected to mention that I am actually also a teacher. So I, I teach in the Montpelier uh, Roxbury School District and uh, physics and engineering and math. And uh, so I'm still teaching one day a week right now on Mondays when we don't have session. So I, I think I... Um, I'm a little bit unique in that. Um, I think there's a couple of other uh, teachers in the legislature right now, but um, but yeah. So I, I have quite a bit of contact uh, hanging out with students and talking about 
you know, of the, the issues that matter, you know, how uh, mental health and stress uh, is going for them, you know, all the way from that to like, you know, how G chat GPT is like affecting um, their, their um, you know, classes and whatnot. Um, and so, uh, and, and then in addition with the government operations, I believe we're actually planning to have I think it's the Youth Council um, come present to government operations. Um, uh, I think it's either this week or next week. So, um, so if there's some intentional uh, communication that's happening there as well. Um, so, yeah, thanks. Thank you, Matt. Willow, go ahead. I mean, do you wait? Just like here. Just like here. Next meeting. <laughs> So our first question was to keep it school-based, was if you could change one thing about the school, what would it be? And then the responses were a better community, the standards for grades, to have pizza Fridays. <laughs> um, <laughs> callback changes, and then what makes you get up in the morning? And then someone said, my boyfriend, tech, sports, possibility that I'll get to art slash create, the fact that I get to see my friends and go to tech every day and actually learn and have fun, an alarm. <laughs> <laughs> what is the difficulty you face on a daily basis, school, friends, family, work, etc. How best could, could the school help support you? And someone said racism, someone said go into U32 after tech, there's no support. Remember, remember to do homework, remembering everything, tired after a long day, exhaustion. And then uh, another one was, what gives you joy? And they said, family, my friends, my dog. And then, what is something someone wouldn't know about by just looking at you? And these responses really showed how much students are drowning in their feelings and how they can thoroughly express themselves. How bad my anxiety is, I'm extremely worrisome, I'm from North Carolina, that I don't like math, I'm trans living in a transphobic household, I don't know myself, I hate myself, IDK. So it really just varies from pain that students face on a daily basis and it shows how much mental health is a very prominent thing throughout anyone's life. And I think high school is definitely a way, a place to show a healthy way to get help and to be overall better and feel better. Thanks. Her youngest member has joined us. Anything to say? <laughs> And <laughs> Not yet, sadly. <laughs> Soon, hopefully. <laughs> so, thank you, everybody. As you can see, well, oh, go ahead. Um, given that no one wants your attention during the legislative session, what is what do you find is the most effective way uh, for folks to convey their views to you um, and that you're receptive to? Um, because in that there's just a lot of Going on. So how how as a group would be able to do that? Uh, that's that's fruitful for you, and also you know, will be advocated. Um, I try and meet with people, but as a committee chair, I am booked through lunch every day. Uh, so finding time that isn't at eight o'clock in the morning or five o'clock in the afternoon is hard. Emails, um, I think we all do our, e you know, stay up on the emails, we get a lot. But that's, I try and answer all of them. Sometimes something gets lost in the, the mix, but that's a good way and then that to initiate something. And then, um, you know, if it needs to go further, we can, talk or, or work things through. But I think email is probably the, the best initial way. Yeah, it's an email, except that I can't 
can't keep up with them, so <laughs> don't get mad at me if I don't respond. So to try again, and that, so like this last week, I had somebody that just kept saying, I'm pushing this to the top of your email list, and that worked. So I finally found the time to, to respond to them. But I mean, meetings are good, things like this are great if you could find the time. So coming to the State House and talking to us, it's harder for the constituents, but it is helpful for us because we're, we're there and then can have an actual one-on-one -on -one in person discussion. Yeah, and you know. After hours, we could set up Zoom on the big screen. Yeah, we did some town halls like that last year. We'll do some more of those. Those are, those are helpful. Because actually talking to somebody is definitely the best way, but it's hard to do that with as many people as there are. I mean, we have, I think 62,000 people that we're representing. So we're obviously not going to talk to all of them. <laughs> and our district has gotten much larger. We're going to Randolph next week. Um, Stowe. Stowe. Uh, it, it probably takes over an hour to get from one end of our district to another. So we have a lot of new territory. Yeah, on that note, I think us school representatives have many of your constituents and um, work really hard to get back to people. I mean, everybody works hard to get back, but like Andy said, just, you know, the longer you're probably in your position, <laughs> uh, the more emails you get, and it's really a flood during the session. Just a reminder that we're out of session for seven months of the year, and that sometimes is a better time to have longer conversations. Um, so I, I would agree that just email is a good way to start a conversation uh, for me. And um, I would also put a plug in to keep pages plenty busy that you can call the state house and get, especially for one-way communication that you want to make sure your representative or, or senators read. I'd say that's a great way to get, like we get handed a message and read it. And especially if it's pretty timely with something going on, uh, it's just a really great way to be like, oh, this constituent or this group is clearly giving me a message that this is important. Um, so I would just remind everybody Great way for one-way messaging. Yeah. You said most of it. The one thing, the one thing I would add. Of course, we have it a whole lot easier than for senators in terms of volume. But um, make sure to put your town on your email because email doesn't have a return address, and we get a lot of emails that come from people on the other end of the state, and it's. Not that I don't care what they have to say, but I don't really. I don't have the time to answer, you know, people who are from all over the state. And um, we want to prioritize you. We want to prioritize you, right? I want to prioritize people from Berlin and Northfield um, in responding and connecting with and so forth. And when when you don't know where the person's from, then you can't um, do that prioritizing. And on that note. Um, we might not be on the right committee, but it's our job to then connect to the people that we can grab every day on the floor or in the cafeteria. So you know, we can be a con often more conduit because we don't we can only sit on one committee and that's our focus. But we can be that conduit. Well, thank you very much for being with us tonight. And there's coffee and some cookies, and fruit in the back, and uh, all that. Nice Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So I'm Gillian. I'm the principal here at Gary. And I did just when before mention there's also a restroom. If you go right out the door to that second door and right on the right, there's a restroom. And I encourage everybody to stop and look. Our kindergarten, getting ready for the hundredth day of school, which is a big deal in elementary school. If you have elementary age kids start counting out hundreds worth of things because they won't tell you to the morning up. But our kindergarten did a hundred things that we kindergarten and Jody and I think what it does is it I mean it just makes me all get the feels because it just really reminds you like just the joy and the wonder that our kids feel when they come here every day and I'm sure it's true for every school also a particularly excellent kindergarten class this year <laughs> 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 we won't go into details. <laughs>
Well, on, on that note, I'm going to let Megan speak, but I just want to say you can put our email on the second tier, but prioritize our student email. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, thank you for coming. Um, we really appreciate it, being here in whatever manner you're here. Um, and uh, I probably should have kicked this off this way, um, but I'll do it before, before we move in. Um, I'm not sure if people know this, and I thought of it, Andrew, when you said February is board member recognition night, and um, that's part of why you all have a very um, unsatisfactory and not enough gift at your seat. Um, but we do just want to thank all of you. You put a lot of time and effort and um, time here and time not here, and we really appreciate all of our board members, and I wanted to say that before, in case we lose audience members when our legislators leave, I wanted to say that now, so thank you. Take a five minute and then ask them to support the budget. Do what? Oh, ask them to oh yes, please. The you all, yeah, please support our budget if you live in our district. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, support our budget. I can't tell you how to vote, but kind of support our budget. Please, please. please. support the budget. Tell your friends to support the budget. You talk to a lot of people. Tell them to support the budget, please. So I have a couple of adjustments to the agenda. We already called the meeting to order and mm -hmm. I just started at the beginning. I know that we didn't put here any adjustment, but I think you guys will agree with me. I would just wanna, uh, we wanted to add uh, one topic, which is budget communications. So is that, okay, mm -hmm. you guys, there's a couple of things on that. So we'll add that, uh, let's do that last, do the, the we we'll do number three, four, and then at five, we'll move into budget communication. Okay, with everybody, thumbs up. Okay. Okay. Okay, so we're gonna do from two to five here, and then we're gonna move into the room where we were for our quality committee to do the three executive sessions so that people at Dodi can undo the room. And we, we won't need ORC anymore because there will all be executive sessions. So is that it? Okay with everybody? Okay. So let's get started. We approve the use of fund balance for the strategic planning consultant. And we have some paperwork here. If you guys could have a motion and then we'll have some discussion. I move. I move that the board authorize the use of fund balances for the purpose of executing a contract for strategic planning consultation not to exceed $62,000. Thank second. you, so that second, wait, okay. okay. You got that, Lisa? Yes. 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 Okay. okay, discussion? Any questions on the memo? On Jonas? Just to be clear, this is not the process that we need to undergo to talk about the structure of the district. This is a separate process. No, this is the this is, planet and the Okay, my understanding was that that was gonna, that was happening somewhat separate from strategic planning. No, it's fine. I'm just just clarifying. Well, I think I think what we've been talking about is in order to have a conversation about what's our structure, we have to know yeah. what it is we want for kids and families. And right. the strategic pro the strategic planning process is designed to engage our communities in what we want for students. And then it will need to give us the information needed to be able to then have really concrete conversations about structure. So they're not unrelated, but that's how I would. That's how I would describe it. So this this group won't have any extra. There's that mic right there next to. Uh, this group won't have any expertise in um, dealing with schools that are being potentially consolidated or anything like that. They'll just be providing a process. Um, Sorry. Yeah, yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> I should wait for the mic. Uh, their expertise is in strategic prioritization, instructional outcomes, equity, um, how to help schools know 
and, and engage communities in what they want for students. That is their expertise. They don't come in with um, specific, uh, they're not coming in, you know, some districts approach this work from a, uh, we're doing a building an analysis or a, or a numbers analysis. That's not what they are coming to this. They're, they're coming to this with the instructional, educational, and community engagement expertise. Is, is it, in a, just a for time purposes, um, just because the, you know, the uh, predictions that we're getting is that something's going to happen next year. Um, is this process going to be done quickly enough so that we'll then be able to engage the community in terms of any potential consolidation or collapse home schools, things like that? Just to put the word. Okay, do you have time for that? Yeah, that's why we're bringing it to, that's why we're bringing it now so yeah, that we right. can quickly and hire the director so that we can get going with the process and then and get going with it. when I say get going with the process we don't have the process yet. Right now it's just engaging them on the work. Yeah. And the intention and the desire, this is why we desire you to approve the use of fund balance is that then we can execute a contract and begin this month, in the month of February. And the goal is to have it um, the bulk of the engagement portion and the resulting information in the December, January time frame of next year. So that, that would mean we have time to do any of the... Mike, we can hear you. you. Oh, sorry, sorry. Would that, I mean, so then we're really talking about if we do anything in terms of schools within a year later. I'm assuming, just time-wise. The length of the contract with them is through December, January. The okay. information that we will receive will be earlier, and I would imagine the first step of the process is them pulling together the group to plan the process, and we will adjust that timeline accordingly so that we do have what we need in time. I just wanted to make sure folks know that this contract extends into next year so that they also can support us during that process, too. Yep. Thank you. If I could, can I just kind of restate the way I understand this is yeah. we've asked the group to um, acknowledge the, the challenges we're having with population and everything else as we engage with the community. So that's, it's not the only factor, but it's an important factor. But the outcome of this particular process will be a vision and strategic pl plan on a pretty high level. It's not a restructuring plan. It'll inform the restructuring plan. So a year from now, hopefully, if it goes well, we'll have a strategic plan. But then we'll have to get to the hard work of, of a restructuring plan, if that's what's called for. And so I think you're getting at, like, what about next year's budget? And yeah. I think we're going to learn some things about yeah. next year's budget, but it's not going to be the master plan, okay. you know, by next year. Thank you. Yeah. It, might, it, it will help us seize the opportunities that we might have to gather. Yeah. It doesn't necessarily mean school closure, right? So it depends. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? Oh, two. Has there been discussion on like the size of the planning group that will work with the consultant? Mm -hmm. okay. Exactly, not yet. That's what they it's will do. It, right, we've asked them to help us design the process and then carry out the process. So both. Question piggybacking on that. Is that planning process going to include community stakeholders? Or, okay. And then the second question is there were two um, bids made are either of these Vermont businesses, and if they're not, you know, what um, types of school communities and communities in general have these organizations focused on in their work because we are small and rural. Yep. Yeah, thank you. So, Great Schools Partnership is a New England firm. Their office is in Maine. They do a lot of work in Vermont and have for quite a number of years. In fact, they've done work with us before at U32. Um, so they are very well aware of kind of the, the type of clientele we are. The other firm was a Vermont firm. And what I would say is that um, in the conversations with the stakeholder group and the follow-up conversations with both organizations, Great Schools Partnership really understood the depth and the time and the energy that we needed out of this. Their proposal was a lot more robust and frankly included more time with us. The other proposal was um, also very interesting and had a lot of good things. And in fact, we took some ideas from that proposal, asked Great Schools Partnership if they could integrate that. They were very receptive. 
Um, but I think Great Schools Partnership understood the magnitude of the amount of engagement we want, the, the engagement of all of the voices, including ones we don't hear often enough, that was really important. Um, uh, Cost-wise, actually, once we realized how each organization calculated the price, um, actually, Great Schools Partnership was, if anything, less expensive per day, but they really understood what we want. That was probably the biggest difference between the two. So. I would just put in a plug for great schools. I've worked with them at Barry, and I still am in touch with the consultant because the work they did was so valuable, and she knew the community, and she made it a part of not, it wasn't on visioning. It was on coaching in that area, but um, they they know these small communities, these rural communities, and I I looked at this and thought, well, that's a lot of money, um, but maybe I'm not as gung-ho about visioning and strategic planning as I am concrete things, um, but I have faith that they'll do a good job. Any other questions? All those in favor of the motion as read, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Aye. Hearing none, the motion carries. Thank you, everybody. We are very excited. Okay. Let's move into approving the teachers. Can you read them? Yeah. Yeah. Hand me that one. Yeah. 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 Can I do all three at once? I think, I think so. so. Okay. I've yeah. done that before. Yeah. Um, I make a recommendation or a motion to accept the long-term substitute recommendations. Jen Donovan, long-term sub at Romney Music. Emily. Langsner, sorry, a uh, long-term sub at EMES for music, and Max Sagala, long-term sub for U32. Could I have a second? Second. Thank you, Daniel. Any discussion? All those in favor? I, I, do a, I do have a quick question. Sure. Um, does the music teacher at EMES, does that change the fact that um, there was, I guess, a volunteer that is teaching the band at EMS right now. Eric, that's a good question. I don't actually know the answer to it, and Alicia is not here at the moment. So we can follow up on the answer to that. And Thank you. Yep. Any other questions? Seeing none, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? have it, the motion carried. Okay. And then, oops. Before moving to executive session, it, we, I wanted to talk a little bit about our plan for, for the budget, and we were wondering if the board would be okay with having a present. We, this time around, we took a little bit longer with the budget because it was harder, and we haven't had a presentation by the board to the community besides the presentation that we have scheduled already for March 6th. So taking advantage of our meeting on the 15th, if we wanted to start that meeting and we would record a presentation giving us an opportunity to reach out more community members. So it's a proposal we just wanted to add it to the work plan and start planning for it. The steering committee meets next week, right? Yeah, next week. So we will to the bulk of that work at the steering committee. Uh, we already have a presentation going, uh, and then we would get it divided. And just wanted to touch base with you guys if that was OK. We don't need any formal motion. Uh, uh, <laughs> yeah. yeah. And, uh, and at the same time, you know, encourage board members to, you know, if you, somebody is reaching out to you, we, we will start putting stuff out. Uh, now that we, you know, with the information for this meeting and information on, on the budget, if community members are reaching out to, to you, encouraging them to, you know, support our budget. Yeah. That's all I have for. So yeah. that, um, it passed, but the percent increase doesn't have to go on the ballot, correct? Oh, there's another. Yeah. Yeah. So do we need to, I was wondering if we had to vote on that. Yeah, so 
Um, if you remember, and we had lots of other important things to talk about that night, which is why it probably didn't. Um, the short answer is, you acted on the language with those percentages in it because the law hadn't been passed yet. And that is what went to our printers. Mm -hmm. So had we, and Suzanne had, had shared a little bit when we were in the other, when we were at East Montpelier, had said, hey, just, you know, kind of made us aware of it. But again, that was a big night. We had a lot of audience. And we did not spend a lot of time on that. Had we taken a motion that allowed some flexibility, we might have been able to make that change, but we did not. Um, so it will go the way that the law required it before. That's an unfortunate oversight. Yeah, well, and the main, main thing is that it had gone to the printers already, because right. we, we could have, but you know, we could have had an emergency meeting, but it had already gone to the printers, so it's yep. much more involved than yeah, and just to give a sense of timeline, the governor signed the law on Thursday yes. afternoon and it went to the printers Friday morning. Mm -hmm. So there would not even have been time. Um, it really would have been, yeah. And it's no regrets. Yeah. We, we did the right thing. It, it's fine. I trust the community. I, 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 I'm not concerned. I, we did the right thing. No regrets. Completely agree with what Jones just said. And you know, for the sake of transparency, which we talk about a lot, having percentage out there mm -hmm. should be there. I mean, community should know what we are meaning by this budget and give them full information, make a full choice. Yep. I mean, that's our hope. Yeah. I'll echo what you just said. A lot of robust conversations in my household about transparency, yeah. um, and including it where I was in feeling the same way as you are that. Um, I want this to be supported, and yet, the, you know, it is really important that people know what they're, they're voting for. Um, the second thing i just like to suggest is, in addition to a presentation, it would be really nice to have something that is social media friendly. Yes. It's just real simple. It is an image. It can go on Instagram. It can go on Facebook. It is not pages and pages, and it just explains the very, very, very little information, but gets is a talking point. Um, I think that, that would reach a lot of people who are not going to read a presentation. <clears throat> and just to be clear, I was not trying to be untransparent, <laughs> <laughs> whatever the opposite of transparent is. Um, I just think that a lot of people only read what's on the ballot and won't attend our presentations necessarily. So I, I think it makes it even more important that our communications about the budget don't just include a 12% increase, but what does that mean for the individual taxpayer? Because the 12% sounds scary, and when you look at the numbers, it's not as scary. Um, so I think that we just need to be even more diligent about our messaging. You said that the 12% is not the thing that people see. Okay, I agree. So with that, um, I want to move us into executive, our first executive session. So if I could have a motion. I make a motion that we go into executive session for the purpose of negotiations, superintendent evaluation, student enrollment request. And to include, so, to, wait, 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 to include me Megan and Suzanne, Suzanne for the negotiations. Yeah. Yeah. Include Megan and Suzanne for, for negotiations. Yeah. Are we going to need to adjust it to include anybody later? I don't believe so. Okay. That's all. Sorry. Do I need to include that? All right. Yep. Yeah, no, that's it. Oh, that's exactly. Yeah, so second by. <laughs> no, I'll second it. Yeah. <laughs> Are you sure that you did one? Joshua? Can we get it out? Okay. Second. So, all right. There you go. If you have it, Lisa. So. Moved by Lindsay, second by Joshua. So the, the student enrollment request, that will not include the administration? That will include Megan. Megan. Just me. Not yep. Megan. Okay. And there, that will be the only one with an action out of executive session, which we can probably just let you know. <coughs> Lisa, what? We'll, we'll let you know oh, yeah. through so, Jonas. So, sorry. Yes. Yeah. Just me. Yep, just me for the remaining two. Yeah. I am in this one. Yep. And if you link me, I'll finish it off. 
Thank you. Thank you. All those in favor, to signify by saying aye. 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 Gillian is probably standing there so she can...